आर्काइव्स ऑफ प्रसार भारती प्रेजेंट्स द टाइमलेस ट्रेजर ऑफ गोल्डन एरा Welcome to Living on the Edge. Syed Ismail from Bangalore writes this letter expressing his concern over the hazards of environmental degradation and how it affects us. It is common knowledge that disasters like the Hiroshima bombing and the radiation leak at Chernobyl had an effect not just on the people exposed to it but also on children born many years later. It is a myth however that it is only disasters such as these that are responsible for possible deformities and disease in the children born after them. Here is a report. It's another faceless woman. After hours of gripping labor, the baby is born, not wailing and kicking, but deathly still. She leaves the hospital not knowing why her child was born dead. The doctor didn't tell her why. Perhaps the doctor didn't really know. Another place, another time. A woman has a miscarriage. Another has a child with painful deformities. Growing from a fused cell into human form, the fetus has been known to be sensitive to sound, the outside environment and the mother's metabolism. And so when the environment has poisonous substances, it is absorbed by the mother and then passed on to the developing fetus. Though very often it's difficult to draw clear links between chemical poisoning and its effect on the embryo, documented case studies show that exposure to these substances might in fact have disastrous effects. and could result in deformities or even stillbirths Today the presence of poisonous chemicals in the environment in levels that can be harmful is not all that rare Industrial toxins vehicular exhaust and pesticides all add their share of chemicals And while both men and women are affected by this pollution pregnant women tend to be more vulnerable Their changed physiology increased heartbeats and blood volume results in greater absorption of harmful chemicals which act as teratogens or substances that are capable of causing malformation of the embryo the entire fetus starts with two cells the sperm and the ova and then like once they fuse then they become four cells eight cells and multiply that so depending on what stage the bombardment of the chemicals or the radiation so these things takes place uh, they if it is too drastic then nothing will proceed further and there's a time the whole thing gets aborted if it is slightly the growth has taken place and there are certain tissues uh, some portions that are forming the say the renal system the kidney some portion which is supposed to form the brain some portion which is supposed to form the spine depending on which cells are uh, which chemical is you know managing to come and affect that then you it presents with the abnormality of that particular system Let's travel back in time to a not so far off place. Japan's Minamata Bay in the late 1950s. An unusually high number of children born to women here showed painful congenital abnormalities, mental retardation and physical defects. It was only years later that it was traced to toxic waste containing methyl mercury that was being dumped into the sea by an industrial unit. Methyl mercury had entered the food chain through fish and women who had eaten a lot of fish during their pregnancy gave birth to malformed children but you don't have to look so far afield thousands of people died and many others were forced into a life of suffering when methyl isocyanate gas leaked from the union carbide plant however what got little attention was the fact that many children born in the years to follow had severe deformities and functional defects but it would be wrong to think that these cases are rare and isolated and only a result of major industrial disaster this chemical onslaught is not always so dramatic 
subtle chemical poisoning is more rampant but can be just as disastrous. This industrial estate is like any other in the country. Poor infrastructure for effluent disposal, apathetic factory owners and a blatant disregard for pollution control norms characterize it. The result? Millions of litres of toxic effluents from scores of chemical factories have seriously polluted groundwater and the soil. And local people subjected to slow poisoning are already showing signs of deteriorating health. Anjama's condition is particularly alarming. She has suffered 12 miscarriages and she is not the only one. It is now known that many of these chemicals have the capacity to alter chromosomes. And when these mutations threaten the survival or proper development of the fetus, miscarriages might occur. But one doesn't have to live next to an industrial estate for pollution to affect the developing fetus. Vehicular pollution or even cigarette smoke contains dangerously high levels of chemicals. If they inhale it or if they drink it and you know it's absorbed in the blood and then through placenta it can go to baby and you know it can cause smaller babies, growth retarded babies and like with uh, they, the mothers seem to deliver earlier than when you did. Lead, found in cigarette smoke, vehicular exhaust and industrial pollution, causes low birth weight, mental retardation and convulsion. Mercury, discharged by electrical appliances, paints, ceramics and industrial plants, causes nervous system tumors in newborns, mental retardation and deafness. Cadmium, discharged by electroplating factories and deteriorating rubber tires, interferes with the transportation of special nutrients to the fetus, causes growth retardation, skeletal defects and increased sensitivity causes brain anomalies. Carbon monoxide, found in cigarette smoke and vehicular exhaust, denies fetus its life-supporting oxygen and affects the brain, heart and adrenals. Pesticides are another serious cause for concern. Sprayed on crops, they inevitably enter the food chain. They poison fruits, vegetables and even grain. One of the most outstanding cases has been that of uh, uh, the, the, the Handigudu syndrome, uh, which uh, took place in 1975. This gave rise to dwarfs, birth of dwarfs. Some 232 cases were uh, isolated, um, identified. They had taken crabs and fish which was contaminated with pesticides like endrin and, uh, and uh, melatonin. Serious deformities usually occur if chemical poisoning happens in the first three months of pregnancy. But if the fetus is exposed at a later stage, these chemicals have an effect on the functioning of vital organs. And these defects may not be detectable at birth and show up only years later during adulthood. Lower levels of exposure could lead to anemia, a weak liver, lower immunity or reproductive disorders. What's worrying is that the government and industry rarely admits that links between polluted environments and the malformation of the human fetus even exist. Today we are dealing with several thousands and thousands of chemicals and the medical profession has no clue what they cause. With such a wide usage of pesticides and many of these chemicals, it's absolutely essential to at least the data and information that has been made public in other countries, that that should be made, not just made available, but there should be strict monitoring of the kind of things that are let loose in our country. In this infant ICU, many of these babies have been hooked onto life-supporting systems because they were either born with a weak heart or malfunctioning lungs or were dangerously underweight. We will never know why these children were born this way. Could environmental pollution be a possible cause? The question is, are we going to wait till huge populations show severe deformities to be convinced that slow chemical poisoning actually has serious consequences? And are we going to rob many more children of a healthy future? Stray dogs. Whenever we see a dog being ill-treated, we are either scared or indifferent. But did you know that apart from being your community watchdogs, they are also the best terminators of rodents? So the next time you see a dog being ill-treated, do something about it. Either lodge a complaint with the Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, or better still, try feeding some, or perhaps even adopting one. Well, whatever you do, 
Remember, every action of yours counts. Coming up later in the program, how eco products might become a reality in India and how you can develop a fishy hobby. But best, here's an update. Episode 34, May 1995, Bitarkanika. Living on the Edge catalogues the travails of the Bitarkanika Sanctuary on the east coast of Orissa. The fragile ecosystem is home to 62 of the 67 species of mangroves found in India and is the last refuge of the olive ridley turtle and the saltwater crocodile. May 18, 1996. A head count reveals that the number of saltwater crocodiles has come down to 600. In the early 90s, there were 900 crocodiles in the area. The centre has also stopped funding a conservation project begun in 1975 to save the crocodile from extinction. Yet some groups are campaigning against the presence of these reptiles, saying that they pose a serious threat to the people in the area. Verdict. Intense human pressure and poaching is responsible for the decline in crocodile numbers. The drying up of funds will only worsen the situation. As things stand today, an unique ecosystem is in danger of fading away. Rashi Bordman from Reva MP tells us that she wants to use products that are eco-friendly and wants to know how she can go about it. Products are labelled eco-friendly when the process by which it is manufactured does not harm the environment. In the West, manufacturers are cleaning up their processes so that their products can carry the eco mark, because that's what consumers want. In India, very few have heard about it. But what if we had the option between choosing things that were made without harming the environment and other products? Ramil Shanmugam investigates why this has not happened in India and comes up with some revealing answers. Are you an eco-friendly consumer? Can you identify an eco-friendly product when you see one? And are you prepared to pay a little more for something that doesn't damage the environment? Even if the answers to all three questions is yes, you'll find that there are very few products that pass the test. And even if the products did exist, few people would buy them. Even the chairman of the Central Pollution Control Board candidly admits that eco-friendliness isn't a factor he takes into consideration when he goes shopping. If you ask me frankly, as yet I don't think I'm become that environment conscious uh, to ask for an environment friendly product. I am also, when I purchase a product, I also look for a product which is cheaper, which I can afford. Even the Director General of the Bureau of Indian Standards, who certifies eco-friendly products, isn't too optimistic about consumer sensitivity at present. Probably he will prefer performance first, as it stands today, and then he will go for eco. And maybe after another 15-20 years, he will sacrifice his performance and go for a cope. I don't think that will come. The government first introduced a scheme to identify eco-friendly products in 1991. Products were to be assessed for their impact on the environment as well as on the health of the consumer. These products would then be given a label in order to help the consumer identify them. The label was to be called the EcoMark. Today, five years later, not a single such product is available and no one seems to know why. Because the scheme is a totally a voluntary scheme. I do not know why, I mean, these industries are not, I mean, say, coming forward, though we are trying our best to, I mean, interact with the industries. I don't think industry really has done as much as it should do, uh, primarily because industry's prime concerns have been to meet the regulations as spelled out by the government and also to make profit. And so far, it has, not, it has not been a situation where environmental concerns by the public as such equal to good profit. What Kamal Mittal is trying to say is that eco-friendly products would be available when there's a demand for them. Throughout the world, eco-labeling is voluntary. Germany was the first to introduce it in 1977. Today, it leads the world with nearly 7,000 eco-friendly products. The key to its success has been consumer awareness. 
when the eco-label was introduced here in India, we still had a seller market, uh, while in Germany, when we introduced it, we had a buyer market. Whichever way you look at it, the product with the eco-mark needs to be available so that consumers know it exists. With the level of environmental consciousness growing, there's no reason to suppose that consumers won't play ball. Only two applications have been received by the BIS for eco-labeling. Easy, a liquid detergent, was granted the eco-mark, but ironically, the company decided not to carry it. Because the company markets a large number of other products, they feel if they give the eco-mark for only one product, the other products may suffer in the market, so they are not putting it. When contacted, Procter & Gamble, the company, said that it believes eco-seals are not effective in achieving their objectives. Contrary to popular opinion, it claimed that eco-seals do not educate and can even mislead the consumer. In India, only the final product is examined for its eco-friendliness. Environmental violations during the process of manufacture are not taken into account. When cosmetics are made, for example, they have to be tested on animals. This is mandatory under the law. And testing on animals is not eco-friendly by any stretch of imagination. Right now, we'll not say no such a product should not get an eco label, uh, but I also would hesitate to agree with an eco label for such a product. The key to the success of the EcoMark scheme is consumer awareness. But that brings us back to where we started. Eco friendly products need consumers, and consumers need eco friendly goods on shelves before they can buy them. The scheme had envisaged that voluntary consumer organizations will carry out comparative testing of brands which are going to be subject to eco-labeling and disseminate information to consumers at large which will trigger pressures within the marketplace and that will force or persuade manufacturers to go and get the eco-label. That has not happened. We tried to raise the issue with the environment ministry but they were too busy to see us. Ironically, pressure to go in for eco-labeling could come from the foreign market. If India wants to increase exports of textiles, for example, to countries like Germany, where consumer awareness is high, it needs to have systems like the eco-label. Every day, 6,000 new people are getting the HIV virus. Over 17 million people are already infected. Of these, 1 million are children. By 2080, 8 million people would have died of AIDS. Kumar Vigendra from Patna and Kapil Kumar of Chaibasa, Bihar want to know something about the largest mammal on earth, the whale. So we sent Uttara Natarajan to find out details. But the story she came back with was not about whales. Instead, it was about creatures that were bred thousands of years ago for ornamental purposes and are still considered fashionable. But what are we talking about? To satiate your curiosity, watch our next story. Some like them grilled, some like to hook them. For some they mean big money. And yet there are millions who like them just the way they are. The practice of keeping fish is an ancient one. The Romans kept fish in tanks for what was purely a practical purpose, to eat them. It was the Chinese a thousand years ago who were the first to keep them as pets. In fact, goldfish were considered fashionable and were bred only for ornamental purposes. From glass bowls to the modern high-tech aquarium, fish keeping has developed into a popular hobby all over the world. In fact, there are societies of aquarists, as they are called, who meet only to discuss and breed fish. But unlike dogs and cats, fish make quite unconventional pets. You can't pet them, they are not loyal, and intelligence is something you can't credit them with. And yet, fish lovers will swear that fish make the best pets. They do respond to the owner, and they recognize the owner. If I'm keeping a finger into the aquarium, they'll come to me. You know that I'm feeding them, even if they are full. And if I keep a finger in, that, in the aquarium, they'll come to me. When they breed in my aquarium, I feel uh, really it's my pleasure. Always they are in action. That is the main thing. And uh, secondly, they are living thing. 
living thing is always uh, good angels damsels tigers lion heads and silver dollars aquarium fish come with fancy names and in fancier shapes and colors most freshwater aquarium fish are in fact hybrids and have over centuries of being reared in captivity adapted to the aquarium way of life moreover aquarists have created countless new varieties specifically for aquariums these artificially bred fish are delicate and can survive only in a protected environment the aquarium fishes are fancy fishes and they are easily been kept in the aquariums but you should give them the natural environment like live plants and uh, some hiding places for them because some certain fishes they like to hide and they like to make their own like territory whether or not aquarium fish are really happy in a glass tank one can never say with certainty but if you provide them with an environment as close to their natural one they'll make your aquarium their home In fact, experts claim that watching fish swim around could also be therapeutic. People with high tension jobs, troubled minds or ailments are recommended what's called fish therapy. Even if you have any like blood pressure or anything, you really relax. The blood pressure comes to normal as the doctors are saying. If you keep an aquarium um near your dining table, you will eat more. you will see your fishes and you will keep on eating i i have practical experience that claim seems debatable but if you want to become an amateur aquarist here are a few basics keep a spacious tank with few fish to begin with don't tap on the aquarium glass or put on the light suddenly it will startle and frighten your fish accessories like a water filter a heater and a reflector light are the minimum requirements and don't overfeed your fish once a day is more than enough fresh water fish are easily available at pet shops and if you buy a pair you could even see them breed in your tank in contrast marine water fish can't be bred in captivity and continue to be caught from seas and oceans to supply the demand for more exotic species of fish and as they are used to swimming around in the deep a glass tank is a poor substitute the idea of aquariums is to give fishes their natural environment to live in without depleting their numbers in the wild and causing their natural balance to topple so if you're a fish lover you'll realize that marine fish are best left in the wild while freshwater aquarium fish are at home even in tame waters if you decide on this fishy hobby you'll get hooked on for life if you think that decisions on environment protection are only taken by big wigs and that the environment police only recruits people above 18 then be prepared for our agents of change if you're wondering what we are doing well besides having a lot of fun We're trying to test whether or not this sample of tap water is safe for drinking. A Delhi-based organization is training us in how to use these gel tara kits, keeping in mind 14 different parameters. Since most of the tests are based on visual color comparison using standard color charts, using the kits is quite easy. What we're really excited about is that our school has become a member of the recently launched Delhi Environment Action Program which means that for the next few months with a whole lot of other school kids we will be using these kits to see just how clean the water in our rivers ponds lakes tubewells and municipal taps is this is basically we thought children can bring in the catalyze the whole process of change by educating themselves by educating others they are the better if a child cries out for why the quality of environment is like this the society has to listen to it and take remedial action so now with jal tara kits as company we found new roles for ourselves we are environmental police officers 